Thank you very much for coming to this uh, launching event of the Chronic and Lectures of Motor Reasoning. I am Professor Luis Lobo Guerrero, the Chair of History and Theory of International Relations. 78 years ago, in the spring of 1935, Carl Jaspers, delivered by invitation of the University of Groningen, perhaps in this very room, we don't know, a series of five lectures entitled Reason and Existence. In the lectures, Jaspers reflected on the possibilities that arise out of the practice of thinking, he would say, of philosophizing. He was particularly concerned with thinking the rational, always in relation to the non-rational. And the non-rational was understood by him as that which reveals the limits to the ways in which we think. How to grasp the non-rational, how to make it visible and observable, and how to make sense of it constituted one of his driving intellectual concerns. His time was that of 1935 Germany, a time of crisis. It was a time when the traditional idea of the rational had reached far too logical conclusions to be acceptable and tolerable. For him, knowing the non-rational non of the time would allow the possibility to challenge the form of reason that was driving a radical form of politics. In his first lecture, he noted, and I quote, quietly, something enormous has happened in the reality of Western man, a destruction of all authority, a radical disillusionment in an overconfident reason, and dissolution of bonds have made anything, absolutely anything, seem possible. Work with the old words can appear as a mere evil, which hid the pre preparing powers of chaos from our anxious eyes. This work seemed to have no other power than that of a long-continued deception. The passionate revivifying of these words and doctrines, though done with good intentions, appears as without real effect, an impot impotent call to hold fast. Philosophizing to be authentic must grow out of a new reality and there take its stand." End of quote. Jasper's suspicion of reason in a voice of reasoning led him to explore the work of thinkers such as Nietzsche and Kierkegaard as two thinkers that did not matter much at their time, but whose thought created a new atmosphere, one in which reason should be questioned and new vocabularies to make sense of the non-rational had to be crafted and developed. The work brought along not new doctrines, not new theories, or a new metaphysics, but in Jasper's words, it brought along rather a new total intellectual attitude for men. This attitude was, in his words, in the medium of infinite reflection, a reflection which is conscious of being unable to attain any real ground by itself. No single thing characterizes their nature, he said. No fixed doctrine or requirement is to be drawn out of them as something independent and permanent." End of quote. And he added, without the infinite reflection, we should fall into the quiet of the settled and established, which as something permanent in the world, would become absolute. That is, we should become superstitious." End of quote. Jasper's lectures were an invitation to be creative and resourceful in thinking critically about reason and non-reason. I take them to be an invitation to disrupt the intellectual comfort through which ways of thinking, order, and governance advance political agendas that appear benign and necessary. I can think of a few. The so-called risk society, for example in the name of which our individual and collective behavior is shaped, moralized, and policed. Another one that comes to mind is the age of terror, in which exceptional politics of security have become the norm to restrain liberties that were considered dear to a liberal imaginary of life. The time of Jasper's 1935 lectures has of course passed. We live in 2013, a year in which the University of Groningen celebrates its fourth century of scholarly practice and projects itself into the future under the motto towards infinity. These times, as all times, are also times of crisis. How are we to reflect upon the crisis of our time will demand the intellectual attitude that Jaspers recognized in Nietzsche and Kierkegaard. It demands the creation of new vocabularies to understand what is novel and not to employ old labels in dealing with emerging realities. The Groningen Lectures on Motor Reasoning are a space to reflect on ideas of order, power, and governance, assuming that very attitude that Jaspers invited us to assume. The lectures are on 
um, are one of the elements of a wider intellectual initiative that we are launching from the Chair Group of History and Theory of International Relations, which is part of the Department of International Relations and International Organization of the University. Motor reasoning will be our intellectual contribution to the celebration of the 400th anniversary of the university. It will be the ground from which we expect to offer a space for those who are leading the way and thinking critically about the modes in which we reason our world. The lectures are generously supported by the Department of International Relations and International Organization of the University of Groningen and by Globalization Studies of the, of the university as well. Um, which uh, globalization studies running in, which helps us project our effort across the different faculties of the university. And amongst the audience, there would be people from different faculties, which I'm very happy to see here. I would like, uh, now like to introduce our first speaker of this lecture series. Um, and uh, it is nobody else than Professor Michael Dillon, who is Professor Emeritus, of, Professor of Politics Emeritus from uh, the University of Lancaster. Um, Michael Dillon has a very long trajectory in, in academia and his background is not on what is being called nowadays uh, post-structuralist thinking. He was actually perhaps one we could call you, uh, one could call you a strategic analyst in the old days, reconverted into a different way of thinking. And uh, he focuses on researching the, what he calls the problematization of politics, security and war, from the perspective of continental philosophy. He has been especially interested in what happens to the problematization of security when security discourses and technologies take life rather than the sovereign as uh, 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 rather than the sovereign territoriality as a referent object. He has also written extensively on security in war, international political theory, continental philosophy, and cultural research. Since security is foundational to all understandings of the political, he also researches the relation between continental thought and political theory, concentrated increasingly on the philosophy of the event, the politics of encounter, and more recently, divine violence and political theology, drawing on the, on the philosophy of Giorgio Agamben, uh, Walter Benjamin, Jacques Derrida, and Jacques Francier. He's been quite prolific in publications, and uh, as of late, I'm just gonna mention four books that he has worked on uh, starting with uh, his very classic piece, The Politics of Security, published in 1996. Then we jump to the Foucault Politics and War, a, a very important edited volume with Andrew Neil. The Liberal Way of War, published in 2009 with Julian Reed, and his latest uh, monograph, uh, Deconstructing International Politics, which, uh, which was published by Routledge uh, only last year. He's now working, um, he, very recently published an article that I believe is going to stir the debate quite a bit in the latest issue of Millennium, and the title is After Life. So, Professor Michael Dillon, thank you for accepting our invitation to be your guest speaker, and the floor is all yours. Thank you very much indeed, Luis. Um, that's an intimidating introduction. Uh, I'm very privileged to be here, of course, and I want to begin by thanking my host, uh, Luis Lobo Guerrero, Chair Group on the History and Theory of International Relations uh, in the Groningen Department of International Relations and Organization, who, together with Globalization Studies, has organized and supported uh, this lecture series on modes of reasoning. I'm deeply honoured by the invitation to inaugurate the series and, and to follow in the very distinguished footsteps of the many scholars who taught and lectured in this ancient university, especially honouring Carl Jaspers, who Luis has already mentioned. It's in many ways a coincidence that my lecture this evening should echo so many of the themes raised by Jaspers in his lectures to the university in the dark spring of 1935. His colleague Edmund Husserl had already attempted in the crisis of the European sciences and transcendental phenomenology to engage the wider crisis of European thought that had nonetheless already begun to stimulate paradoxically a most remarkable flowering of European thought at the beginning of the 20th century. Jaspers made his own distinguished contribution to that flowering of thought 
at a time when we now know, and he was already acutely aware at the time, Europe was about to descend into barbarism and global warfare. A war, along with the destruction, it reaped worldwide, which also destroyed very much of Europe's heritage, not least that of European Jewry, and the confidence it had once enjoyed and placed in Enlightenment values. Perhaps the most odd and uncanny uh, relationship between work I'd done for this lecture prior to reading the Jasper's lectures was the way in which, as you'll see, I became preoccupied here with the relationship between political reason and political unreason. And it's a more general thing that characterizes Jasper's lectures. And you'll see, and I won't go into it in any great detail because I'm going to basically do it in the lecture, but you'll see that I'm preoccupied with the freedom to say no to politics, rule, and governance, as well as to say yes. And I'm curious about how that ability to say no and the saying no to the existing, currently prevailing doctrines of political rules of truth and truth of rule, how that saying no is too readily and too easily characterized as irrational and political unreason. And so I take as my task of thought what it turns out that Jasper was in fact in his own way urging on us as a task of thought, that of beating the balance, that of walking that difficult line between reason and unreason. Because it's not just reason that is given to thought, it is the line between reason and reason that is given to us to think, not least in dark times and times of crisis. Now I don't make the claim that we face the same catastrophe in emergence that so clearly informed Jasper's lectures. But the scale of the horror of what was to follow after 1935 was not something that any at the time, however much in fear of the rise of fascism in particular, were anticipating. We cannot know what horrors may await our civilization. We do not know if it has the political and cultural resources and reasoning capacities to escape what may be in store for it. But we do know, as scholars and thinkers, that a special responsibility devolves on us in the reasoning that must occur. It's a responsibility to seek to tell the truth, whatever the doxa of power and knowledge currently teachers and practices, to say no as well as yes to the power and knowledge of the rules of truth and truths of rule that govern us and govern our systems. Now I'd like to make one final introductory mark in relation to Jaspers. As Luis has already noted, Jaspers was prescient at that time for the way in which he also drew our attention to the responsibility of thought to think the rational along with the non-rational. To be more precise, to think the differentiation between the two and the relation between the two. And how reason puts unreason into certain contexts, but also how what appears to be unreason makes us rethink the conditions of possibility and the conditions of operability of the doxa of our ruling truths and truths of rule. Inspired by Foucault, and in particular Foucault's reflections on madness and civilization, I will be remarking briefly on the drawing of the distinction between political reason, which I'm calling doxa, and political madness, specifically in the saying no to political rule. And how we must always keep the doxa of the differentiation of reason and unreason, specifically the differentiation of political reason from political unreason, how we must also keep that differentiation under review as thinkers, as reasoning thinkers, aware of the extent to which our reasoning is nonetheless historical and idiomatic and related to the rule that we give ourselves. 
My topic tonight therefore echoes Jasper's. Precisely because there is no rule of truth that does not also relate to a truth of rule. The crisis that was soon to overwhelm Jasper's was a crisis that we face, at least in the same general terms today. We too confront a crisis, the rule of truth and the truth of rule in crisis. But since all truth and all rule arises in their own idiomatic and historical ways, we have to address the crisis in the rule of truth and truth of rule of our time as we encounter truth and rule today. I have chosen to do so then here, not in terms of trying to specify those features that a discourse might be said to have in order to be considered true discourse. My topic is not concerned with truth as such. It is instead concerned with what Foucault teaches is a certain relation to truth. That which the Greeks called paresia, courage of truth, and whose classical and early Christian career Michel Foucault explored in his last lectures at the Collège de France in the early 1980s. Hence my title, The Courage of Truth. Hence also a subtitle that emerged as I did the preparation for my lecture. And one of the wonders of uh, having an opportunity and an audience to listen to you as you talk is that you think through your topic. And the subtitle only came to me about two weeks ago as I was working on the lecture. So the title is The Courage of Truth and the subtitle is When Truth Strikes. And as with all subtitles, the subtitle inflects the reflection on the main topic. So it's the courage of truth when truth strikes. The subtitle therefore lends my reflections a certain inflection, a concern that Foucault's lectures did not in fact develop, and yet I do not think that this inflection, when truth strikes, is at odds with the spirit of Foucault. Neither do I think that my poster boy for this evening's lecture, Russell Brand, would offend Foucault either. There is a comic and tragicomic tradition in relation to truth-telling in general and the courage of truth in particular that dates back at least to the classics, to Aristophanes, that threads its way in the English-speaking world uh, through Chaucer and Shakespeare, think only of the fool in Shakespeare, to Beckett and Joyce, Irish but English-speaking. And then elsewhere, in other cultures and European traditions, to Rabelais, to Brecht, along with many others. Russell Brand is in that tradition. Comic, mad, wild, a classic fool or clown which does not make him, appears to put him, as it were, in the camp of unreason, but in fact is a way of truth-telling that one has to add to the other forms of truth-telling that Foucault derives from the classical tradition. Those truth-tellers, the prophet, truth-teller, the sage, the truth-teller, a teller, that was a Freudian slip, <laughs> the truth-teller, the truth-teller, the prophet, the sage, okay. and the professor, who were most the professor telling the truth. So think of the poster and the picture of Russell Brand telling the truth after his fashion. And I deliberately chose that self-mocking portrait Existential angst mocking portrait of Hamlet as my poster. Also, Russell Brand is my slave for the evening. Recall the Roman triumph. Recall Caesar's enter into Rome after the defeat of the Gauls. Recall what the triumph for the Romans was, the ability of the commander to come with his booty and his slaves and his defeated captives and his soldiers into Rome itself, to cross the Rubicon as a matter of triumph. 
but recall also there was always a slave in the chariot with the leader. And the job of the slave was to whisper in Caesar's ear, remember you're mortal, remember you're mortal. In other words, to tell the truth to a leader celebrating the brutal triumphs of his battles. So in that sense, Russell Brand is sitting in my chariot this evening, whispering to me, remember you're mortal, in the inimitable ways in which he develops it as the kind of comic that he is. So I look at the poster and they're here, Brand's version of the very same truth. It's a powerful antidote to taking ourselves dogmatically, to taking ourselves deadly serious when it comes to the business of the games of truth. Beware those who would confine the figure of the truth teller to the ones that Foucault introduces out of the ancient past. Prophet, philosopher, sage, later scientist and professor. There is always and everywhere in the ranks of the truth tellers, the clown and the comic. The worst possible thing you could do then is actually talk about them because that is the way in which the joke and the truth telling power of the joke gets dispelled. So back to my professorial truth telling. Imagine now then an obscenely wealthy and spendthrift society functioning on the basis of a founding barbarism, the cruelty and injustice of its relations to other cultures. Yet, crevant de bonne conscience proud of its humanitarian feelings and concerns. Imagine it flourishing at the cost of the steady depletion of other life forms, including human ones, yet insisting that it is becoming more ethical. Imagine a vastly materialist culture in which the will to continuous economic growth continuously also seeks re-enchantment, hungry for some spiritual endorsement of its global rapaciousness. Imagine a culture increasingly dominated by normative forms of education and entertainment, but nonetheless eager to assert the unparalleled richness of its intellectual and artistic heritage and life. <coughs> Entering into the commercial selling of that uh, inheritance. Imagine such a society claiming to extend and disseminate knowledge as never before while seeking to constitute and regulate thought in such a way that it becomes governmentally suborned within administratively conventional and ruthlessly positivistic horizons of so-called relevant knowledge. Imagine it celebrating the democratic openness and effectiveness of the dense networks of communication and information upon whose opaque infrastructures of social, economic, financial and political interaction it relies systematically engendering unintended consequences capable of wreaking catastrophe throughout its systems of life and rule. Imagine such a society celebrating life and seeking to make life live, remorselessly treating it nonetheless as continuously on probation, a mere occasion for infinite and indefinite surveillance and audit without having any idea of what would satisfy the conditions of probation or specify what it was for other than to render life endlessly open to governmental regulation and worthy of being so ruled. Imagine how such a society gorges on the information engendered by the will to know, driven by an appetite for total surveillance, fueled by a scrambling insecurity as a generative principle of formation governing every institution, practice and expression of it. A securitizing, increasingly so total in its imperative, that all other values once espoused become faint echoes of a life it once <laughs> proclaimed. Imagine it proclaiming peace and prosperity while comprehensively dependent upon wealth and techno-scientific expertise generated by micro as well as military strategic security systems, including chemical, nuclear and biological weapons of mass destruction commercially exploited and sold globally. Imagine such a society terminally self-endangered, triumphantly celebrating destructive capabilities, the manufacture and dissemination of which are integral to its economic prosperity. Such a society does not need to be imagined. We know it. But few, I think, are capable 
tell the political truth about it. And so to the epigraph that heads my lecture. It's from Foucault, a little book of his, which was a, a lecture uh, taken from a wider lecture series. The book is called Fearless Speech. And this is the quotation. Foucault says there, my intention was not to deal with the problem of truth, but with the problem of the truth teller. Or, he says, truth telling as an activity. Who is able to tell the truth? About what? And with what consequences? And then, always the punchline for Foucault, and with what relations to power? Thus inspired then does Michel Foucault pursue what were to be his last lectures at the Collège de France, most notably the hermeneutics of the subject, the government of self and others, and lastly, the courage of truth, the government of self and others too. Foucault died on the 5th of June 1984, shortly after that last lecture series ended. Next year will be the 30th anniversary of his death. Foucault's preoccupation with modes of reasoning and madness, and with the relationship between modes of reasoning and modes of power, government and rule, was the light motif of his entire work. And I honour the work that he did in this lecture today. No thinker enjoys the secure possession of his or her thought, however, even in the thinking that they themselves do. This was very much also, I think, the tone of Foucault's researches and reflections. And so one's relation to thought must be that of the usufruct, usage, to be had in it. And where the thinker is fallible, there is the room for your own thinking. Enjoying the use to which you can put it without, so far as possible, abusing either its tone or its substance. Inspired in turn by Foucault, I therefore seek to make use of what I've learned from Foucault, these last lectures especially, and to pursue here what I take to have been his overall project. For, more broadly, one might say, and in fact he did say, in so many words, that his work concerned, quote, the politics of truth. Not a politics of truth confined merely to the analytics of power knowledge, which much of Foucault's reception has been concerned with. Not a politics of truth seeking to abstract itself from the world. Rather, a politics of a truth that takes place out with the capillaries of power knowledge and continuously, if intermittently, befalling the world and its subjects, throwing their existing rules of truth and truths of rule into confusion and disorder. Not a politics of truth confined to dominant modes of reasoning in the modern manner, then, that of what he calls connaissance, or knowledge production, upon whose digital exhaust our modern rules of truth and truths of rule now seem to be choking themselves to death. But thinking concerned with the politics of truth that adopts a certain, somewhat unstable, but nonetheless tenacious relation to truth, in beating the bounds that tie reason and non-reason together and differentiate them and then re-relate them, taking this dangerous, unstable and liminal domain as the very terrain of thinking itself. And I fashioned that before I went to Jasper's lectures. Michel Foucault has also described his task in these last lectures in the following way. Not concerned, he says, with telling truth as such, but with exploring changing relations to truth as the understanding of truth changes in response not only to how truth intermittently strikes us differently at different times in different places, but does so in response also to changing power relations. Power relations with which, and in which, truth is always and everywhere invested, each idiomatic in its own way, idiomaticized, if you will excuse the, the English invention there, idiomaticized also by the ways in which truth and rule inescapably leach into one another. In this intimate relationship between truth and rule, knowledge and powerful Foucault does not disqualify or devalue either. It is rather, I would say, in some kind of brutal fact themselves, in recognizing a certain reality of the world. Remember, we are mortal, we are not gods, and so our truths and our knowledge is bound to be 
invested in our forms of life and relative as well as relevant to them. There is, in short, for Foucault, no rule of truth without a truth of rule, just as there are no truths of rule without rules of truth. And so specifically, he asked in the hermeneutics of the subject lectures, how are truth telling and government, governing oneself and others? Begins Socratically with Alcibiades asking Socrates about this. How are these linked and connected to one another? There and in subsequent lecture courses, Foucault also excavates and explores a very specific relation to truth. It's a relation to truth that is simultaneously also a relation to power. Its history revolves around and evolves through the career of the Greek term palaisia, or courage of truth, as different formulations of practices of palaisia travel from the Greek into the Roman and on into the early Christian world. A trajectory that took palaisia from fierce fearless assertiveness in the face of power to trembling obedience in the face of God. The Shir explained at the beginning of the hermeneutics of the subject, quote, I'd like to continue the study of free spokenness, Franck Paulet, or Paresia, as a modality of truth telling, rather than analyzing the forms by which a discourse is recognized as true, this task would involve analyzing the form in which, in his act of telling the truth, the individual constitutes himself and is constituted by others as a subject of a discourse of truth, not that of the discourse of truth in which the truth about the subject can be told, but that of the discourse of truth which the subject is likely and able to speak about himself or herself. To analyze these forms of practices of truth telling, he says, about oneself, by relating them to a central axis, which is the Socratic principle of know yourself. But I think he says, drawing a critically important distinction, it would be interesting to situate these practices in a broader practice, defined by a principle of which the Delphic precept, this is itself only an implication and the wider Delphic precept from which know yourself derives and in which it's located is take care of yourself. Epimelia, he ought to. Now the one enjoys the subject to know itself while the other to take care of itself. There's a difference, a profound difference. The one presupposes there is a self to be known and through that knowing to be governed by the truth of itself. The other cannot presuppose the existence of the self or the truth that shall govern it. The task set by the second precept, which happens Socratically to be the original one, is instead to engage truthfully in the continuous self-construction, the art of life, or techne tu vio, arts and Greek sense of ascesis, the Foucault feared had become fugitive where they had not altogether disappeared from the modernization of the world. Knowing oneself is a form of taking care of oneself, he teaches us. One form of taking care of oneself, only. In response to the precept, know oneself, however, the knowing subject becomes a function of the regimes of knowing to which it subjects itself and through which it becomes subjectivized. Foucault long taught that the modern subject does become enslaved to the veridical as well as the governmental apparatuses now the digitalized connaissance of government practice socially and economically as much as politically, that institute a voluntary servitude to indefinite government that currently characterizes Western forms of power and law. We modern subjects, then, are the, the kinds of subjects that positively seek the transparency and total surveillance of ourselves, the opacity of whose political truth necessarily, if paradoxically, escapes us, not least because it hardly even arises as a question, much less a political question. The other precept of taking care of oneself enjoys us, of taking care of oneself, enjoins us to reflect upon oneself in the context of power and knowledge in which one finds oneself. How then are we to take care of ourselves? under our currently governing rules of truth and truths of rule. How might the precept of taking care of oneself at the Maria Hulotot arise in relation to modern political truth 
and modern political reason. Rules of truth and truth of rule that seek so comprehensively to know and track the subject, which is in turn obliged obsessively to know and track itself. How to take care of oneself under such a regime is the question I want to pose. Who knows, asks Socrates, what taking care of oneself is? One thing we do, however, know is that the task of taking care of oneself today does occur in conditions set by the digitalization of a connaissance and self-government that is, paradoxically, quite out of control. It's precisely in response to this line of thought that Foucault goes on to state quite boldly that, quote, there is no first or final point of resistance to political power other than the relationship one has to oneself, and the reason is clear. It's because the point of application of power knowledge of the rules of truth and the truths of rule of our current regimes of knowing and ruling take as their point of application the self itself. So if that self is to resist, if that self is to say no as well as yes to rule, then the point of application of the no is in the self as well as the point of application of the yes. The problem that we face is the same as that then faced by the ancients, in a sense. In one sense, it is a technical question. How are we to take care of the self? What techne is required? What practices are appropriate for taking care of one's self? Foucault, as he goes through an exegesis of the Greeks and the Romans, notes how one's self can mutate into the soul within the Christian tradition. But the real difficulty lies in the question that coexists with techne, since it never precedes it, but only ever arises simultaneously with techne. There is never a metaphysics, for example, without a mechanics. There's never an ontology. There's, sorry, there's, never, there's never a technology without an ontology. These things co-arise. One does not follow from the other. One is to be derived from the other within the historical context of rules of truth and truths of rule that obtain in relation to the technologies of rule and the ontological rules of truth. Here then, the self cannot be understood to be the self of preformed properties, the truth of which have to be known. The self here has to be a work that takes shape, not a substance comprised of preformed properties. It's precisely here, and despite Foucault's inclination sometimes to lament their loss, there's a pathos in Foucault, and that he also calls political spirituality, as well as the courage of truth arises. Topics he explored in his now notorious uh, reports on the Iranian Revolution, as well as in the lectures of the 1980s. And I want to argue that political spirituality and the courage of truth are not lost to the modern world as Foucault was inclined to lament, but actually do have a place and find a place there. I don't claim in doing this that they offer a solution to the problematic of how to take care of oneself. I don't think there is a solution to it. There is a market for ideas in it, and you can find them in every airport and every railway station. And but the books are to tell you how to take care of yourself. I'm sure, in fact, that they do not. But the many violent refusals of modern rule that we now witness today, within the West as well as outside of the West, whatever way and however one defines the West, the many violent refusals of modern rule, practice at least as much by rulers proclaiming the rule of law, like Bush and Blair, as the ruled who rise up against the rule of law. These many violent refusals bear witness, among many other things, no doubt, to the continuing relevance of both political spirituality and the courage of truth in and to the modern period. Here then I wish to propose that the problematic of political spirituality and the courage of truth is directly relevant to modern politics, government and rule, not least because it fugitively arises within the institutions and practices of modern government, politics, and rule. I would want to add, in addition, to contrast the problematic of political spirituality and the courage of truth with that of political theology, of sovereign discourse, of politics, government, and rule, 
or the emergency of emergence that characterizes biopolitical forms of growth, which combine the sovereign and hey, the sovereign and the biopolitical, institute and serve a widespread mentalité du gouvernement, comprised of and obsessively cultivating an infinite civility to indefinite governance is part of the civil a society of Western forms of rule. If political spirituality and the courage of truth arise today, they do so as practices concerned with taking care of oneself under modern rules of truth and truth of rule, characterized by systems of self-knowing that nonetheless render modern political truth deeply opaque to the modern political subject. The more we know, the less truth we seem to understand. And in particular, when that political truth is so deeply opaque to the very political subjects that are supposed to be secured through and free by governing apparatuses of truth, now running, to quote Edward Snowden, the largest suspicion-less surveillance in human history. It is the parrot, the parhesiatic relation to truth that therefore concerns me but concerns me precisely as it arises in the modern rather than the classical world. This transfer of attention then requires some modest revision of Foucault's conclusions, or at least the addition of another inflection into that work. Concerning the politics and the courage of truth as he explored their career through the classical and Christian worlds, but now bringing it into the modern world, organized, structured, with a doctrine of rules of truth, truth of rule, which condition the taking place of truth and rule. First, revision. Whereas the vast bulk of Foucault's explorations concerned how different styles of uh, paresia uh, were enunciated, explored, and adopted throughout the ancient world as forms of life, the Epicureans, the Stoics, the Cynics, and so on. Here, my emphasis lies with how truth befalls the subject and strikes it into unanticipated and untutored modes of truth telling. I'm most interested to document truth-telling paraisiastically, that is, exhibiting the courage of truth, that impacts the subject. Actually, better to say, subjectivizes the subject, more than the subject choosing it. The, choose, the subject here is made by, through the impact, or the impact or the strike of truth, rather than choosing this as a form of life. Moreover, it's precisely because modern political truth is so deeply opaque to the modern political subject. It's digitalized arcana imperii pervaded always, pervaded always by the imminent and imminent fear of a crisis of rule, as mysterious to its practitioners as much, frankly, as it is to those who buy them. That political spirituality, whose absence from the world Foucault is inclined to lament, nonetheless, I think, finds a place within it. This thought arises in part through Foucault. When Foucault departs from close exegetical engagement with the ancient text to abstract and offer an analytic of the features that the courage of truth recounted in them seems to share. And so, for example, Foucault emphasizes that the courage of truth is not a matter of technique. Neither is it a question of learning or responding to mentoring. He says very precisely that the courage of truth is a matter of timing. He also observes that this matter of timing is related also to how a crisis of political institutions arises as a possible site for Palaisia. That this moment shifts the subject's attention from the life of the institutions, the doctrine of the rules of truth and truth of rule that obtain, to the ways in which one lives one's life within those rules. Thus the courage of truth appears to occur in a certain and at a certain moment, contingent, unexpected, unanticipated, intermittent. And that moment, however much it might recall the Christian version of Kairos, there have always been other accounts of Kairos, entails no domestic-like conversion. Rather, it's a refusal. Specifically, it's a refusal that finds its expression in the freedom to say no. No to the ruling doctrine of both truth and rule, to a rule of truth and truth of rule that is always specific. Now I'm thinking here, and I should inject the four uh, spectres uh, that haunt uh, this essay. And they are, of course, 
Julian Assange, Edward Snowden, and recently renamed Chelsea Manning, together with, and I've forgotten his name, and I tried to commit it to memory, the Tunisian boy who immolated himself, precipitated. It was Tunisian, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, who burns himself to death and precipitated uh, the revolts and the no saying and refusals that spread like wildfire across North Africa and into uh, uh, Egypt. So they're, 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 they're in the back of my mind. They're also a provocation uh, to this lecture, to the thinking in this lecture. In some sense, all three or four ruined by the way in which truth struck them. Their lives blasted into some outer limbo of asylum, incognito life, prison, and where the Tunisian was concerned, death. Thus, the courage of truth appears to occur in a certain moment, but the more, and it's a chirological moment, but it's not a Damascene conversion, but it's something to do with the refusal of the existing doxa. But not a refusal, very important, not a refusal to truth as such, not a refusal of rule as such. It's always specific, it's idiomatic, it's this rule, it's this truth, it's those systems, it's this ruler. That's where the refusal comes in. And that's the object of the refusal. If truth and rules are both historic and idiomatic, then similarly the moment of saying no is a response to the current doxa of rules of truth and truths of rule, and it's one, therefore, that must find its own idiomatic and historical mode of expression, contoured by the prevailing rules of truth and truths of rule, but blasting these apart. The very opacity of modern political truth to the modern political subject is intimately related also to the courage of a truth that tri strikes suddenly, if intermittently, and in ways that precipitate the subject of this truth out of the currently prevailing orders of truth and truths of political order, in which they find themselves into lawless domains, marginal to, or indeed, wholly beyond the law. Marginal to, indeed, and wholly beyond the currently prevailing realm of political reason. Indeed, it is, uh, commenting on the Iranian revolts, Foucault actually uses the expression the madness of political revolt, clearly having his text on madness and civilization in his mind. Have no doubt, the game of truth is a dangerous game, and the courage of truth is one in which questions of life and death are always imminently and imminently at risk. Being struck by truth necessarily therefore threatens. It threatens criminalization in general and death in particular. Albeit ways are being sought, for example, to extend the protection of the law to so-called whistleblowers in the West. And I'm thinking here of Julian Assange, Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, and so on. What they exploded were the truisms, the institutionalized rules of truth and truth should rule, the doxes of our contemporary politics, their thorough self-corruption, and the absence of other adequate ways of characterizing the opaque political truth in which they, like we, remain trammeled. Not least in that they had no other way of expressing their refusal of contemporary rules of truth and truths of rule, so compromised by the systems of total digitalized governmental surveillance that they disclosed, than the very doxers which legitimate them even as they offend against them. There is then, to return to the criminalization to death point, a price to be paid for the courage of truth. Even a courage of truth so diversely, so obscurely, and so differently expressed by these three in particular in explanation of what they did and defense and rationale of the course that they took when they detonated. I'm thinking in particular there of Manning and of uh, Snowden. Assange is, is different again. Foucault's exploration of the texts on Parisia and spirituality repeatedly make this point about the price of truth. It's not a price you choose to make. It, uh, it's not a price you choose, as it were, to pay. This is the other point. It's a price you. It's a price extracted from you when truth strikes. So the price of courage is also levied in many currencies, in many forms. Courage itself is enigmatic. It's enigmatic even in the tradition of military courage. Most sensible soldiers avoid those who get medals. 
There's a bad luck that attaches to them because those that get medals quite clearly are in some peculiar realm of unreason from the reason within which military combat ordinarily is expected to take place. You can recognize the courage, but hey, do not rub off against it because the guy was mad. Courage itself comes in many forms. It's as varied as the occasions that incite it, and mostly the courage of truth is unwitting. You ask any medal winner, and they cannot readily explain why it was they did what they did. They will ordinarily say, well, I was there. It had to be done. That was my job. I did it. They just come out with these kind of banal expressions because I think, I think the courage that suddenly was inspired within them was something that was quite unwitting, something they hadn't expected, and beyond reason. An unbridgeable gap seems to remain between what happened and the sense made subsequently of what happened. Asani, Snowden and Manning each paid their price for the courage of truth and in current sneeze they could hardly even have anticipated. Perhaps also the courage displayed was expressed as well as paid for in terms of the enduring and suffering that they have had to pay since. Second, let us be very clear that Foucault's interest in spirituality, political spirituality in particular, for which he was much criticised in those Iranian reports, was not a return to religious mysticism. Spirituality is not to be conflated with religiosity or with the varied traditions and rich traditions of religious mysticism, for example, those of the Jewish, Islamic and Christian faiths. These are themselves specific forms or practices of spirituality, the Christian ones of the early medieval period in particular, brilliantly analysed and politically contextualised by Foucault's contemporary Michel de Sautot. So my second revisionary inflection of Foucault here relates to Foucault's argument concerning the modern conflation of truth with connaissance, which is knowledge production. Note especially how Foucault defines spirituality as something that arises when truth is opaque and the subject of truth is not pre-engineered to receive it, much less to welcome it. Quote, Foucault says, the truth is not given to the subject by a simple act of knowing as it is in connaissance, which will be founded and justified simply by the fact that he is the subject and because he possesses this or that structure of subjectivity. Foucault recalls in the hermeneutics of the subject Practices of spirituality postulate that for the subject to have right of access to the truth, the subject must be changed, transformed, shifted, and become to some extent and up to a certain point other than himself or herself. And so, spirituality postulates that the subject as such does not have right of access to truth and is not capable of having access to the truth by virtue of the features that the subject is said to possess as a subject. It postulates that the truth is not given to the subject either by a simple act, therefore, of knowing. I am a subject. I am structured in such a way that I can use reason or whatever, certain techniques to know, and that the world is also structured in such a way that my techniques, by some kind of miracle, have give me access to this world. Spirituality doesn't understand the world that way and it doesn't understand the subject that way. Spirituality postulates that for the subject to have right of access to the truth, the subject must somehow undergo a transformation. It's partly that also that made me reflect upon the business of how truth strikes and when truth strikes, it affects that transformation. Manning did not want to go to jail. Snowden did not want to end up in some incognito airport lounge in Moscow. Assange, more enigmatic and a different, a different example. The truth is only given to the subject here under this concept of spirituality at a price, the price that the subject is willing to pay or is forced to pay to bring about that transformation in which the relation to truth becomes a different one. But such as he is, such as she is, the subject as structured is not capable of the truth. Work has to be done. 
The implication in Foucault's exegesis is that the subject can do that work on themselves, and of course that's what the Cynics, that's what the Stoics, that's what the Epicureans, that's what the early Christians preach. My inflection is that may be so, but I think the example of Hassan, Snowden, and others is that they get hit by the truth. And it is being hit by the truth that does the transformation. And that the courage that they exhibit is not a recent choice, but is somehow suffering the impact of the transformation that being hit by a truth that remains opaque wreaks upon them. That's a different kind of courage of truth, I think. In short, and to emphasize three definitive points from Foucault. First, the opacity of truth is the prevailing condition of possibility for spirituality. Specifically, political spirituality, which is specifically why I'm emphasizing that the modern political subject of knowing knows a lot, knows a heck of a lot, but the political truth of its condition is radically opaque to it. That's why I think spirituality here has a relevance to the modern world. The opacity of truth is the prevailing condition of possibility for spirituality. Second, the opacity of truth is compound, compounded by the structures of the self. The self is not worked in such a way that, or given in such a way that, the truth can become transparent to it, merely by an act of knowing. That's not how the self is structured. Third, spirituality is not to be conflated with a religious experience. It can't take the form of a religious experience, but that's not the same thing. Spirituality concerns the practices that the subject must pursue or suffer and endure in order for it to become more receptive to or capable of responding to and reorganizing itself in relation to a truth that will never be rendered transparent but in respect of which somehow is compelled to align itself and seek to measure out its own share of existence, including that of recruiting the current doctrine of truth and saying no to truth and rule that currently prevail. I don't think, of course, that this reflection is a comprehensive one and deals with all the issues that it raises. Of course it doesn't. What then follows? Well, I think what then follows is a thinking politically that we've hardly begun to think. And of institutional transformation and change that we've hardly begun to introduce. Well, that's another matter another lecture, another book, another set of reflections. And add three additional summary points. First, an opaque truth works its effects through the ways in which it befalls subjects. It strikes, strikes intermittently, contingently, and devastatingly for the settled mores and practices of the conventionally conceived and practicing subjects of politics, knowledge, and law. Second, when truth flares up in this way, subjects may, they may also not, Seek to nurture the flame, seeking to translate it into something more enduring by way of practices that bear witness to it, and which I think might merit the term spirituality in the ways in which Foucault analyzes it. Third, it takes courage, the courage of truth, to bear the impact of this eventual and scandalous character of truth, even more to remain faithful to it in pursuit of ways that would bear more enduring possibly even institutionalized witness to it. Conversely, however, and to clarify the point, Foucault thinks that political spirituality and the courage of truth are absent from the world because they have been displaced by knowledge. And there's a very, very profound, important distinction that he sometimes explicitly makes and sometimes supposes and presupposes. And that is a fundamental distinction between truth, let's put it in inverted commas, and knowledge, let's put it in inverted commas. Knowledge is something that arises out of what he calls veridical practices. It's a kind of positivistic knowing of the world. And in this respect, Foucault is deeply Kantian. Truth is not accessible by those means. In that sense, he's deeply Kantian. But in another sense also, he sides with modern science. We can observe the world, we can measure the world, we can gain technical mastery, control, intervention into and over the world as understood by our technical proficiencies. But no scientist claims the truth, I think, in that sense. 
Foucault defines spirituality in contradistinction to modern connaissance. He does so in as pithy an observation as any that he ever made. I can't resist quoting it to you at some length. And it is dense, so I'll take it slowly. It took me a while uh, 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 to absorb this observation, so it's hard on you to get it for the first time. But it's worth it. This is it. If we define spirituality as being the form of practices which postulate that, such as he or she is, the subject is not capable of the truth, but that, such as it is, the truth could transfigure and save the subject, then we can say that the modern age of relations between the subject and truth begins when it is postulated, reversing it, when it is postulated that, such as he or she is, the subject is capable of truth. And here's the thing for the modern period. But that, such as it is, the truth cannot save the subject because the truth has been displaced by knowledge. According to Foucault, then, modern connaissance thus presupposes the accessibility of truth to a subject pre-engineered for it pursuing it very largely through positivistic practices immersed then in a regime of knowing reliant upon the self-certainty and transactional freedoms of the Cartesian subject, the very limits of whose epistemic certainty can nonetheless disclose flying foundationally within the structure of the cogito itself. The tragedy of modernization is that the truth is inaccessible to its knowing and that it cannot save itself. Recall once more, then, the defining features of spirituality and of how these are related to Peresia as a set of practices that cultivate the subject's truth-telling capacities, especially in relation to power. Spirituality, as Foucault analyzes it here, concerns the practices governed by the opacity of truth and the fact that access to truth is not given to the subject such as he or she is as a function of its very makeup, but somehow or other that subject has to undergo practices or transformations or the impact of some kind of truth striking event change the subject. The courage I think there is involved not in recent choice but enduring the suffering and the ruination that being struck by truth can wreak upon you. Hence the manifest opacity of modern political truth to modern political subjects engineered by plural modes of subjectification, in a knowledge of whose workings they may be obsessively involved and knowledgeable, only to discover that the political truth of these arcana in theory remain op opaque even to its accolades. This is not just the ruled who don't understand what's going on. Neither do those ruling the arcana in theory. In other words, the opacity of political truth is as opaque to the rulers as it is to the rule. Which is one of the reasons why I'm convinced that this imminent sense of crisis of governability and this imminent sense of crisis of governability is characteristic of modern government, which increasingly revolves around catastrophe, emergency, security, and so on. Some additional, or at least some different observations are therefore called for when exploration of the courage of truth is extended like this into the modern period. Since albeit truth and power take place differently there, the opacity of modern political truth and the makeup of the modern political subject might equally witness, have witnessed, have witnessed the problematics of the courage of truth and the re-engineering required of the subject if it is to bear witness to that truth. The scandal of truth lies precisely in the fact of brutal <coughs> that truth, as distinct from knowledge, does not arise as a function or expression of the operation the structure of a willing reasoning subject. Here the subject does not precede the truth and the truth is not an outcome of the faculties of the subject. Rather, the subject is struck by truth, struck as a coin or work of metal might be struck, its faculties emerging in response to the ways in which being struck by truth, the subject flares up in response to truth and works that unintended, often unsought flaring into a formation of itself. What especially scandalizes here is the demotion of the reasoning subject that has dominated the modern imagination in relation especially to both truth and power and political reason. Such a 
such a subject, from the point of view of the doctrine of existing political reason, is mad, is in the realm of unreason. A subject, the anthropological centralism of which is assailed on the one hand by the self-destructive protein forces sought and unleashed in its name, as well as by the cosmology emerging from its sciences of the infinitely small and the infinitely large astrophysics to nanotechnology, whose space, space times mock the anthropological centralism upon which the idea of the subject has long been founded. If what these sciences, among others, teach is the relativity of space-time, from God-time through man-time, on into life-time and now start-time, the scandal is also that the truth, rather than knowledge of the matter, of matter as such, even as we materialize matter through our systems of knowing it and bringing it to measurable, intelligible presence, is radically indifferent. Truth here, radically indifferent, as well as opaque to humankind. It's a truth written with pathos for humans. If truth only strikes intermittently, if truth strikes at least as much, if not much more than it is sought, if in being struck by truth, human beings have such profound difficulty in welcoming and recomposing themselves to its flare up, if truth is what more often, if infrequently, is what befalls us, then what is the nature of the courage of truth that arises in response to the truth experienced in this way? And where, if anywhere, how, if any how, is hope to be found in circumstances of existence in which truth, like goodness, is a rare and independent phenomenon that, commanding us much more than we command it, is actually systematically denied by our contemporary dispositives of rule and regulatory orders of informational power knowledge. Perhaps a vestigial hope at best, fleeting, fugitive, and evanescent. It's not the compulsory, manufactured, and commercially traded, banalized optimism that occupies the space of hope in our current rules of truth and truth of hope. A truth grounded then, instead, in the freedom to say no, as well as yes, to our prevailing doxa. Perhaps a hope that expresses its allied courage of truth in the very capacity to bear the ruination threatened by its impact. There is therefore no capturing such a truth and the manufacture of it, or manufacture of its allied hope. No faking the courage it may call up and call upon. Capture is beside the point. It misses the truth. Or put differently, and recalling Foucault's focus on the relation to truth, the relation to truth to be had here is not that of command and control. It's different in kind. If such a thing is possible, conceivable or even operable, a different relation to truth is called for. And it must entail its own kind of courage. Courage as rare and intermittent as truth and goodness. I do not claim that Asanya, Snowden and Manning courted such courage, chose it. I don't think they did, but I don't know. I imagine they hardly knew themselves. But forms of courage were on display there, even recklessness. But of course, recklessness is most often, most often associated with courage. And we are indebted to them for their example. An example that provokes us to think further about how truth strikes in and through the very capillaries of informational power and knowledge which so distinguish how we have come to be governed locally and globally. Never forget that it was when they were at their terminals trading in power knowledge, operating in the digitalized world of surveillance and information, when at their terminals, the truth struck. And through the mismatch between what they were seeing in the terminals and what they'd been brought up to believe was the case. We have then to foster a much more idiomatically canny reasoning in our reasoning than our prevailing rules of truth and truth's rule are that, or ordinarily endorse at least. If we are to spot how truth strikes and how courage arises in the midst of that impact and how hope lies there as well. <laughs>
That's a further reasoning, a further reason for invoking a sound, slow than the manner. I'll end with one final observation. It brings us back to Enlightenment via Foucault and allows a final reference to Carl Jasper. Evidently then, pursuing the changing career of Palaisia, reflecting on the allied and equally changing problematization of spirituality, as well as truth, courage, and power, Foucault was nonetheless also fueling a project that went back in him at least as far as his early thesis on Kant's anthropology, as well as his later, more famous essay on Kant, What is Enlightenment? And what are we and who are we today? The history of the present. For the courage of truth and the phenomenon of political spirituality, especially, I would want to argue in addition, might perhaps be no less important, albeit in their own ways, to the history and ontology of the present, for which Foucault called in Kantian mode uh, than they were to the ancient world. For all these misrecognized on the one hand as a nihilist and on the other as a mere technical analyst of power, Foucault was, of course, neither. This project was in many ways that of philosophy classically conceived. But while committed to truth telling, every philosophy, like every religion, nonetheless also accepts the opacity of truth, its fundamental mystery. No philosophy or religion has claimed that truth was transparent to human beings. And no philosophy and no religion, so far as I know, has ever claimed either that the world had to be accepted in the historical forms that we inherit. Or that we must align ourselves to the rules of truth and truth of rule of which that inheritance is currently comprised. The world given to us historically has always been grossly unjust. Indeed, a mounting catalogue of horror and catastrophe if not extant, but then in prospect. How could thinking reconcile itself to such a world, even though it finds itself within such a world, often as we are today, in very privileged positions in such a world? I think it's one of the functions of an ancient university to allow that kind of thinking to foster, nurture, and take place. Foucault too was struck by the opacity of truth. The additional twist that he gave to it was to insist on the historicity of truth as well as of power and to document how always and everywhere truth and power in their very opacity of their positivities are idiomatic, making their presence felt in the ways in which they take place, taking place only ever in a here and a now for human beings. But he recognized also and through his very insistence on the microanalyses of these here's and these now's that their very historical finitude was nonetheless also contoured by an outside of some varying description, or none at all, since it was inaccessible as such. Another mark of Kant and Foucault. Not necessarily true to Kant, but like I'm doing with Foucault, using Kant. Possibly of using him. Foucault also refused this world of doxa historically given to us. His reflection on the politics of truth were always tempered by an acute appreciation also of the nihilism to which its ruling ontotheological expressions have been habitually given. However much it may do so, opacity does not necessarily spell impotence to reason or unreason. On the contrary, opacity is a subject of reason. It has force. The force frightens us, just given to us to think. Think of justice. Here's a task of thought that beats the bounds which tie reason and unreason, political reason, political unreason, the practices by which a differentiation is made between the two, and given those practices by lethal force, extreme rendition can be perpetrated against those categorized as inhabiting the realm of unreason. As with truth, so also with the opacity of contemporary political truth in particular, the issue becomes that of thinking about our relation to it and our composure and dispositions within it and towards it. Thus, the more our current rules of truth and truth of rule seek to make the world informationally transparent to us, 
thereby more amenable to manipulation and control, paradoxically, possibly tragically, the more it appears that our imaginaries, as well as our conduct, become increasingly confined to it and imprisoned by it, and the very political truth of it escapes us. This is a challenge that provokes, refreshes, and renews rather than suppresses reason and thought. For me here, inspired by Foucault, seeking to use his thinking rather than merely engage in an exegesis of it, it's very specifically the opacity of political truth concerning our contemporary rules of truth and truths of rule, our informationally organized and dependent orders of government and rule, that concern me. And slightly most about the examples of Hassania, Snowden, and Manning. Three lost souls. It seems as if for all three of these it was the very opacity of contemporary political truth to a political order founded in the virtues of transparency, privacy, and freedom, which are claiming to be an effective form of representative and accountable government, while totally corrupted by the will to secure security through a mounting digitalized totalization, that struck them as true and brought their existing lives to ruin. Their courage, however, in enduring that, 